Donald Trump delivered his vision for fighting ISIS this week. How does it match up with Hillary Clinton's? Counterterrorism expert Dr. Walid Farez is here to break it all down. And record-breaking floods hit southern Louisiana this week, displacing thousands from their homes and causing untold damage. But where is the media coverage and what's being done on the ground? Baton Rouge Bishop Robert Munch will tell us. And finally, Mother Teresa is set to become a saint in September, but some claim she's anything but. Catholic League President Bill Donahue answers the charges and discusses his new book, Unmasking Mother Teresa's Critics. The World Over starts right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A very warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Walid Ferris, Bishop Robert Munch, and Bill Donahue are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show or if you have a question, I'll be live tweeting throughout. You can find me on Twitter at Raymond Arroyo or you can email me at worldover at EWTN.com. Well, here's the brief news from the world over this week. Donald Trump's campaign took another unusual turn this week as the GOP nominee has again reshuffled his top staff. A reported reaction to sagging poll numbers, demoted after just two months as campaign chairman, was political veteran Paul Manafort, though he's still with the campaign. Taking the executive reins of the campaign, former investment banker and leader of conservative news outlet Breitbart, Stephen Bannon. Trump pollster Kellyanne Conway will assume the day-to-day -day operations as campaign manager. Neither have run a political campaign before. According to campaign sources, Trump had grown frustrated with his sagging poll numbers, lagging operations in key states, and the continued attempts to temper and moderate his populist outsider approach. Conway said on CNN Thursday that the campaign will sharpen its message, but that Trump will remain authentic. On the campaign trail, Trump is talking terrorism. In a major policy speech on Monday, the Republican nominee said stricter immigration measures are needed in the fight against terrorism. Moving away from his call last year to ban all Muslims from entry to the United States, Trump is now calling for the, quote, extreme ideological venting, or vetting, rather, of immigrants in order to block sympathizers of extremist groups or those who don't embrace American values. He pointed to past terror attacks as evidence for the need to overhaul the immigration system. The common thread linking the major Islamic terrorist attacks that have recently occurred on our soil, 9-11, the Fort Hood shooting, the Boston bombing, the San Bernardino attack, the Orlando attack, is that they have involved immigrants or the children of immigrants. Clearly, new screening procedures are needed. Trump said the battle against Islamic extremism is an ideological one, akin to the Cold War struggle against communism. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton was not impressed with Trump's campaign shakeup. She said it will have little impact on his controversial political message. Clinton told supporters at a rally in Cleveland, there is no new Donald Trump. He can hire and fire anyone he wants, but he's still the same man. The Democrat nominee also went after Trump's tax plan and his own taxes. Under his plans, Donald Trump would pay a lower tax rate than middle class families. Of course, we have no idea what tax rate he pays because <laughs> unlike everybody else who's run for president in the last four or five decades, he refuses to release his tax return so the American people can't really judge. Clinton then took a shot at the rich, promising to go after the super wealthy corporations and Wall Street to pay their fair share in taxes. Meanwhile, abroad, ISIS is on the defensive in three countries. In Libya, after pitched battles throughout the week, government-backed forces have stripped ISIS of its control of almost 200 kilometers of territory along the Mediterranean. The Islamic State has fallen back to the city of Sirte 
its last remaining stronghold in the country. Battles continue there. In the Nineveh Plains, Iraqi and Kurdish Peshmerga forces continue to battle Islamic State. This week, more than a dozen villages east and south of Mosul have been liberated after being under ISIS control for two years. Mosul, Iraq's second largest city, remains the last major urban stronghold of the militant group in Iraq. The UN Refugee Agency said this week that more than 100,000 people have been displaced as Iraqi forces cleared territory ahead of the expected battle for Mosul. And in Syria, Russian warplanes targeted ISIS and allied Nusra Front militants in Aleppo and elsewhere, destroying major ammunition depots, training camps, and three command posts. On Friday, U.S.-backed forces retook the city of Manbi. The city was seen as a major loss for the terror group, as it is a key supply route between the Turkish border and Raqqa, ISIS's unofficial Syrian capital. In spite of the battlefield losses, ISIS continues its strategy of terror. On Sunday, a suicide bomber killed over 30 people on the outskirts of Aleppo. And in the Libyan capital city of Sirte, a suicide car attack left five people dead and injured more than 30. More on the fight against ISIS here in the U.S., abroad, and what Twitter is doing online in our next segment. And at least 64 people have been murdered in the Democratic Republic of Congo this week in a machete attack by suspected Islamic rebels. Government officials have described the massacre as a revenge attack for successful military operations in the area. The Congolese army says the massacre was carried out by the so-called Allied Democratic Forces, an Islamic group that originated in neighboring Uganda. These killings are the latest in a series that have left over 600 people dead in the region since 2014. And back in the U.S., flood-wracked southern Louisiana is now facing the long-term challenge of recovery. This after what is being described as the worst natural U.S. disaster since Superstorm Sandy. Torrential rains led to historic biblical flooding in the Baton Rouge and Lafayette areas. Some areas saw more than 30 inches of rainfall. 13 people have died, 30,000 needed to be rescued, and more than 40,000 homes have been damaged or destroyed. Hundreds of state and local roadways remain closed. At least 70,000 people have registered for federal disaster assistance. The Federal Emergency Management Agency said it is looking to line up rental properties for those left homeless. They are also considering temporary housing units for the thousands who have been displaced. The devastation is unbelievable. More about the floods and how the people of southern Louisiana have come together in the wake of this disaster later in the program. And Pope Francis continues to reshape the Vatican with two major appointments. Dallas Bishop Kevin Farrell has been selected by the Pope to head a newly created Vatican office for laity, the family, and life. The new dicastery is part of Francis's ongoing curial reform and the merging of the respective pontifical councils for the laity and the family. As prefect of the new mega office, Bishop Farrell will focus on the needs of the laity all over the world. The Dallas bishop has a reputation not unlike that of Pope Francis. He is considered a pastoral moderate with an eye for social justice. He's gone on record recently as being pro-gun control and strongly pro-life, but he is not known as a cultural warrior. And Pope Francis also named an Italian archbishop, Vincenzo Paglia, to head two academic institutes affiliated with that new laity office, the Pontifical Academy for Life and the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family. In an unusual move for the pope, upon naming Archbishop Paglia to the posts, the Holy Father also issued explicit directives, namely that Paglia should focus on promoting the merciful side of church doctrine. Church watchers note that the appointments signal a more moderate direction for Vatican offices responsible for hot-button issues such as abortion, contraception, marriage, and divorce. And political television pioneer and former Jesuit priest John McLaughlin died this week from complications from prostate cancer. 
For over three decades, the former priest and speechwriter for President Richard Nixon hosted the nationally syndicated McLaughlin Group. The show revolutionized public affairs program with McLaughlin's brash, combative style of interviewing and debate. Eleanor Clift, Pat Buchanan, and Mort Kondracki, among others, were part of the panel for 34 years. Their spirited debate inspired many copies, as well as a classic Saturday Night Live spoof by comedian Dana Carvey in the early 1990s. Wrong, Eleanor! This past weekend, McLaughlin made headlines by missing his first show in 34 years due to ill health. In a statement, he said, quote, I'm under the weather, but my spirit is strong and my dedication to the show remains absolute. He passed away at his home in Washington on Tuesday. Bye-bye, John. May you rest in peace. When we return, Dr. Walid Ferris will dissect the counterterrorism plans of both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and much more. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. We should only admit into this country those who share our values and respect our people. In the Cold War, we had an ideological screening test. The time is overdue to develop a new screening test for the threats we face today. I call it extreme vetting. I call it extreme, extreme Vetting. Welcome back to the World Over Live. That was Donald Trump announcing his plan to battle ISIS in a speech from Youngstown, Ohio, earlier this week. How does that vision contrast with that of his opponent, Hillary Clinton? Meanwhile, the Obama administration announced the release of more detainees from Guantanamo Bay. For analysis, I'm joined by an advisor to the Anti-Terrorism Caucus of the House of Representatives and a foreign policy advisor to Donald Trump, Dr. Walid Ferris. Welcome back to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want your reaction to this. What does Donald Trump mean by extreme vetting? What does that look like practically? Well, he is coming from no vetting, wrong vetting that the Obama administration has applied, which means you don't ask them if they are jihadists, if they are Salafists, if they believe in the caliphate, none of that. And then to what we need right now, which is we need to know about the ideology. If you are not part of this ideology, then the process will begin normally and logically. Mm -hmm. Now, those on the other side of you say, and I've talked to them this week, we have plenty of screening measures in place. There's a two-year refugee process, they say. We screen these people thoroughly. How much more extreme are you going to get? Well, let me give you the news. Okay. Among those who are doing the screening and those who are advising for the screening are some groups that are linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm. So are the Muslim Brotherhood helping us with the screening? Oh, this guy is a rebel, this guy is a moderate, and we end up having people either in Europe or here who are actually radical. Number two, we need to have with us NGOs from Syrian or Iraqi backgrounds who are secular, who are moderate, who are with us. That's what Mr. Trump was trying to say. Mm. We need to make sure that these are like the dissidents who came from Cuba or Vietnam or uh, parts of the Soviet Union. Then, of course, we will be welcoming them. Mm -hmm. We need to know that, but we don't have that way to, you to don't know. know you don't have that data right We don't now. have it right now. For a simple reason, Raymond, you and I discussed it many, many times. Mm -hmm. The Obama slash Clinton administration, as of 2009, removed any reference to ideology. So when you do that, and I warned that four years ago, if you remove that, we cannot vet. Mm. I want to talk about the number of Muslim refugees who have come into the country, 30,000 in 2016 so far. What does that tell you? Is that a concern to you? Look, we had many of these numbers before. The concern mm -hmm. that I have is why is the Obama administration pushing these refugees to be relocated here? at a time they can resettle them inside Syria and the northeastern part of Syria, which is as large as Lebanon, and the local Kurdish and Sunni moderates and the Christians have told us, they've testified at the European Parliament and in Congress, 
bring the refugees to us on our own soil. So what is it behind this, this policy of uprooting the Syrians and bringing them to the United States? It's political. Mm. It's vote. It's ideology. You think it's to, you think it's to tilt the vote in, in their direction? There is no other explanation. Because if you don't have, let's suppose a refugee is coming from a country controlled by the communists, mm -hmm. from A to Z. Mm -hmm. I understand. But part of Syria is free. Why are you bringing them to the United States yeah. if they can stay on their own, uh, soil. On their own soil? Yeah. Uh, in the same speech on Monday, Donald Trump proposed suspending immigration from dangerous regions in the world. Listen. In addition to screening out all members of the sympathizers of terrorist groups, we must also screen out any who have hostile attitudes toward our country or its principles, or who believe that Sharia law should supplant American law. To put these new procedures in place, we will have to temporarily suspend immigration from some of the most dangerous and volatile regions of the world that have a history of exporting terrorism. What regions of the world is Donald Trump referring to here? Let me give you a couple quick, quick examples. Mm -hmm. Here we have migrants leaving Syria, parts of Syria, mm -hmm. going through the Balkans into Europe. And then go, going to the immigration authorities and telling them, oh, we are with democracy, we are with freedom, we are fleeing mm -hmm. both either the Assad regime or ISIS. Mm -hmm. At the same time, NGOs detect that these persons have a Facebook whereby they are, you know, they are, they are pausing with, with jihadists. I mean, this is incredible. That's why we need to do the screening on multiple levels. Social media is one, NGOs is two, mm -hmm. and educating our screeners. I mean, I have lectured to intelligence agencies without naming at this point mm -hmm. in time, and their analysts told me we can't operate without this information, without the ideological information. Italy is warning that some of these ISIS fighters could navigate the Mediterranean and penetrate Europe, and that they will disguise themselves as refugee seekers, asylum seekers. Is that a concern for the United States? I mean, doesn't the proximity protect us? I met with many Italian politicians and diplomats over the past six, seven months. Mm -hmm. They told me the same thing. And they told me once these refugees slash non-refugee, meaning mm -hmm. jihadists pausing as refugees, because Italy wants to take real refugees. But once these jihadists are on Italian soil, they are on European soil. Mm. And if they are there, later on they could travel to the United States, Canada, with and ease. other countries. With, with, with ease, of course, with visas and everything. Mm. Well, that, that, this begs the question. If you're screening refugees and people trying to get into the United States, exposing them to extreme vetting, are you also going to extremely vet anyone seeking to come to the United States from the EU since they don't have the same level of screening or uh, admission policies? The, the, the principle, you know, the word extreme or not extreme, this is in politics. The reality is we don't want to have jihadists coming to the United States. Should they come from Sweden? Should they come from another planet? That's the, the essence, the philosophy of the vetting process. And that's where we have a political battle with this administration mm -hmm. and with the Clinton administration if she wins because they don't want to recognize there is an ideology. I want to show you the reaction uh, to Mr. Trump's speech. NATO Supreme Allied Commander Admiral James Stavridis had this to say when he was asked about Trump's foreign policy speech on MSNBC's Morning Joe. What really was lacking in the speech was anything about how the interagency of the government would work together, how would use intelligence, how would use cyber, private public cooperation, strategic communication. The only strategic communication I heard was, I hate Muslims. That's not going to help us much in the Muslim world. Your reaction to that? I never heard the term, I hate Muslims. I never heard the term, I hate. This is the propaganda of the Clinton-Obama camp who would criticize anybody who's trying to find a solution. I myself, as an advisor, if I talk about the jihadists, they would call me Islamophobe. Mm -hmm. And the Arab and Muslims talk about jihadists. So this is to tell you that the arguments of the other camp are completely failing. Mm. What about the arrest of this very vitriolic um, British cleric, Islamic cleric, uh, Anjum Chowdhury? who was found guilty this week of instigating and fomenting radicalism via YouTube out of the UK. The UK authorities arrested him. Is this a good move? Or why did they allow him to sit and continue doing this for so long? <laughs> this is a good very, very, very late. Extremely late. You know, we're talking about extreme vetting. Extreme late in this case. 
oh, he has been doing this. He's, he's a public figure of, yeah. of jihadi support. He actually in public supported al-Qaeda and ISIS. So, of course, this is a model that Europeans and Americans should follow, not in terms just of arresting, that's the last stage, but detecting. That's the crucial matter. Mm -hmm. Will other Muslim countries want to work with Donald Trump if they perceive that he, he wants to block somehow their people? And that is the narrative in the, in the, in the wider media. Well, let me tell you something. I have been on Arab media almost every day since he made that speech. Mm -hmm. And since he delivered his first foreign policy uh, affairs speech in April. Right. And we have discussed those issues. States. Guess what? Many Arab speech. leaders and politicians That's and NGOs, I'm not talking about the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah, I'm not talking speech. about the Iranian regime. Yeah. That we know they are against him because he's going to break their lobbies. Yeah, he's going to actually push back no. against them. But a majority of Arab politicians have told me, some of them, some of them in semi-public, others in other channels, that of course they would work with Mr. Trump. They want him actually to change his narrative in a different way. Meaning what? They want him to say, for example, that we and the Arab world are going to be working together. That's what he did a week ago in his speech. He said, I want to reach out to, Mr. to, to President Sisi. I want to reach mm -hmm. out to King Abdullah of Jordan. It's going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I want to share this with you. Vice President Joe Biden attacked Donald Trump at a campaign rally for Hillary Clinton in Scranton, Pennsylvania on Monday. Look. Trump's ideas are not only profoundly wrong, they're very dangerous, and they're very un-American. You know, they reveal a profound ignorance of our Constitution. It's a recipe for playing into the hands of I will end this because you've been standing so long. It's, 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 it's a recipe for playing in the hands of terrorists and their propaganda. Is this playing into the hands of terrorists? Well, the narrative of the Obama-Clinton administration and their brilliant ideas have left behind over the past seven years one million people killed and or wounded, five million mm -hmm. refugees. So which narrative is more efficient? The one of a politician seeking the presidency or the one of incumbents that left disaster behind? Fifteen Guantanamo Bay inmates released this week by the Obama administration. Rather, the announcement of their release was, was, uh, was made public. Uh, your thoughts on that? Does this make us safer? The idea being we're not holding these people any longer. We're releasing them to the United Arab Emirates. And therefore, this will help the Muslim world understand that we're not out to get them. This is second grader thinking in political science and in Middle Eastern studies. Because these people, these jihadi leaders, are going to become what? Star jihad on YouTube. They're going to go and fill the YouTube and fill the internet, and the internet with statements, we are the heroes, we went there, we were strong. So these infidels or these enemies have no uh, stamina to keep us and to maintain uh, Guantanamo because of what you have mm -hmm. done. Because you fought on the ground, the jihadis, America had to release the prisoners. Wow. Uh, Twitter this week announced it is going to shut down 235 thousand Twitter accounts related to ISIS, ISIS propaganda, and those fomenting more of this radicalism. A good idea? It's a good idea, but you know me. I have a much, much more comprehensive strategy. Mm -hmm. Shutting down those who are extremely dangerous and specifically calling for violence, yes. Mm -hmm. We need to work with NGOs to go on Twitter. The more, the better. And be anti-jihadists and defeat them in the debate. That's what we need to have. That's what we need to do, and we are not. Walid Ferris, always insightful. Thanks for being here. Thank Walid Ferris's latest book, The Lost Spring, U.S. Policy in the Middle East and Catastrophes to Avoid, is still available at bookstores everywhere. When we return, heavy rains and massive flooding have swamped southern Louisiana this week. The physical damage has been staggering. Is there a spiritual message in the devastation? Bishop Robert Munch of Baton Rouge is up next to discuss when the world over continues. Stay right there. We lost everything. God, just fell. Fell. We got out safely, and uh, all our friends are safe. So that's the main thing. We picked up a. Uh... A lady's trying to get to her dad. We had a boat, so we're trying to do whatever we can in our, uh, in our time of crisis and disaster. So this is time for everybody to pull together if they can. Nobody's just sitting around watching. Everyone's coming together as one.
Those were residents of Denham Springs, Louisiana, one of the worst hit areas of the flooding this week, where the death toll has risen to 13. The receding water has only begun to reveal the physical toll of this latest natural disaster to hit my home state. 22 of Louisiana's 64 parishes has been declared federal disaster areas. Thousands remain displaced from their homes, and the damages will certainly be in the tens of millions of dollars when all is said and done. Joining me now to discuss the spiritual dimension of this disaster and what the church is doing to provide relief is the Bishop of Baton Rouge, Bishop Robert Munch. Your Excellency, thank you for being with us. And I should share with people, you and I have known each other a long time. You were my high school guidance counselor in New Orleans, so you're to blame, Bishop. <laughs> uh, put it on the grocery list. <laughs> oh, yeah, we, we will. We'll put that on, the, on the, the to answer for list. I want to start with what you're seeing there, Your Excellency, on the ground. What do people need? 20,000 people displaced, 10,000 right. in shelters. What do they need at this moment? Well, they first of all need human and spiritual support because they have experienced a devastating loss. Mm -hmm. Some with friends who have lost life, loss of home, property, possessions, cars, security. And so they have been placed in shelters where they have been lovingly provided for. And the community's response to those who have experienced these devastating losses has been incredible. Yesterday I, was, I received a, a message, and this is just an example, uh, one of the military personnel that were in one of the shelters had asked if a priest could stop by uh, to visit with him. And so I said, well, I'm going to a meeting that where we bring in everybody, in the uh, main leaders in the diocese together, uh, but I would come right afterwards, and I, I did. And so we prayed together when I got to the shelter, and then I met other Air National Guard members, and they said to me what was my experience, and I told them how much it validated my experience. They said, you know, we do this on a regular basis where there's need, and we've been in varying communities at various times. But we have never seen the outpouring of support and spirit that we have experienced in the Baton Rouge area. Mm. And it just so warmed my heart because that's what I was seeing. But they are outsiders, so to speak, who have experienced that yeah. themselves. Our people are good. They're responsive. They are caring. And they have come to help their brothers and sisters in need to serve their neighbor. It's very uplifting and inspirational. Is that the silver lining in all this, Bishop? I've gotten so many reports from family, from friends in the region, reporters, that they're meeting neighbors, some for the first time in their lives. Because of the flood, it pushed them outside. You know, they're out of the air conditioning, the electricity's down, and they're having to interact and pull together to get through this. And what a contrast this is, Bishop. And I wonder if you could reflect on this. What we saw in Milwaukee with rioting and chaos, breaking out attacks on police, here you have a natural disaster. And you don't have any of that. People are pulling together. What's the lesson there for the country? Well, I will tell you what a woman in, who I visited in one of the shelters who was from Baker, Louisiana, the way she dramatically said it to me. God is tired of all these shootings, and so he sent us this flood to make us work together and get along. Mm. And I said to myself, She's a much better preacher than I am. <laughs> but, but what she said and others had said in different ways is that, and I, I have said it this way, what we have experienced is an unwelcomed, an unwelcomed event. Mm -hmm. But if we don't use this event as a graced opportunity for growth, it will be a double disaster. Mm -hmm. And I believe it is bringing people together supporting one another, and it shows, you know, how people respond to tragedy really tells you what's their inner core. Yeah. And I have been so admirable uh, and uh, so admired how the people in the church and in other areas of the community and aspects who've just come out to be neighbor one to another, yeah. and it's heartwarming. Yeah, it's well, heartwarming. The, the spirit and the faith of the people of southern Louisiana really 
it's a special place. And, and I mean, we saw it during Katrina, and I don't think anybody has a sense of what it's like unless you've been through it. To walk into your house and all of your belongings, all of your memories uh, are, are, are just sludge on the floor. There's nothing left. And what that does to mothers and fathers and children and aunts and uncles and grandparents, it can be very jarring. Six members of my own family have already lost their houses in your diocese. Give me a sense of what's happening now. They tell me the waters are receding in mm. some areas, but they're rising in other parishes. Exactly. In Livingston, and by the way, when we use the word parish in Louisiana, that is the the secular word is county every place right. else. But in Louisiana, it's not county, it's parish. So I mm -hmm. always am saying uh, civil parish or church parish uh, yeah. so that people outside of the state understand what we're talking about. Sure. Uh, it, it, it has really touched a lot of people, people's lives. And the waters in Livingston civil parish are receding, but in Ascension civil parish, they are rising. And so it's going to take a while for this massive amount of water to dissipate. And it affects roads. It, uh, it, uh, we've also had wireless uh, technology down uh, for mm -hmm. several days. Uh, so people to get where they need to get. And, for example, these waters, thank goodness for volunteers in boats, came to rescue people just with just getting in their boats and going to see if anybody right. needed needing help that saved so many lives of, of people that were, were there by themselves. Mm -hmm. So, it, the, again, the outpouring of this spirit, and we're not through this yet, and this is just still the first stage of right. what we're going through. And by the way, we're speaking about the Diocese of Baton Rouge, which is 5,500 square miles. To our west, the Diocese of Lafayette, and then to its west, the Diocese of Lake Charles also have experienced damages, not to the extent of the Baton Rouge Diocese, but they mm -hmm. also need to be in our thoughts, our prayers, and our actions. Uh, Bishop Munch, why do you think this story has not garnered the media attention that we've seen lavished upon other natural disasters like this, whether it's Hurricane Sandy, which, this, which reports are saying this is as big in magnitude, or Hurricane Katrina, which was slightly bigger. Why not the media attention, do you think, to this story, these Louisiana floods? You know, you are more an expert in that area than I am. I, uh, uh, I, I don't, it, it, but it's a good human story in the midst of the disaster. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we are quick to point out the flaws of communities right. and less to acknowledge not only a hero here or a heroine there who's doing good things, but the community at large, it tells you who the community in, is and what, what the community is about. And I'm saddened to hear if it is not getting more uh, national publicity mm -hmm. uh, because it is a heartwarming story. And it's, it's also a story of inspiration for others to say, you know what, we need to do this. And we're not the first ones and we will not be the last ones to experience natural disasters. Mm -hmm. But it does show in the here and now how there are so many good people that we, we don't even realize that are, are, are no. nearby to us. No, well, that's what I'm hearing, the coming together of community, which was a surprise. You know, many of these people, they're living their happy lives, but they're isolated. We're in the air conditioning. It's hot. You know, you, 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 you drive to the house. You go inside. Now they're out and they're, they're interacting and pulling together with neighbors in ways they never expected. Bishop, the Advocate newspaper in Baton Rouge has called on the president to break and interrupt his vacation in Martha's Vineyard and come down and show solidarity with the people of southern Louisiana. Do you join them in that call? Is it time for President Obama to come down? Well, I, I, I don't tell anybody what to do. <laughs> uh, 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 but I would say the support that we can get will mean a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, within our own state of Louisiana, people have pulled together, and trying to work together to help and it's, it's, it's been very impressive. Uh, I, I would just hope, and, and by the way, I've heard responses from Connecticut and uh, Indiana, mm -hmm. Illinois, and other, other places. Uh, we, uh, I heard today that there is an 18-wheeler from Virginia packed with materials uh, coming to us. We had uh, a church parish that we helped 
uh, during Katrina in Metairie that is sending an 18-wheeler to reciprocate what we yeah. did for them uh, 10, 11 years ago. Yeah. Th there's just a lot of good things going on. And uh, we, we, need, we need the message to be out that, yes, we have a serious need, uh, mm -hmm. And w yes, we depend upon God, uh, but I like to tell people God's grace makes it possible for us, but God's grace relies on us to be able to activate it, mm -hmm. both those of us who are in the middle of this situation and those who are somewhat outside who can help. Yeah. Uh, getting to heaven is not just being uh, idly spiritual. It's about serving neighbor. Jesus said, you show your love of God by your love of neighbor, and uh, uh, that has been reinforced by St. Mm -hmm. John in, in his letter. Uh, so I, um, I think any, any people who can show the nation what we are experiencing, how they can help, and by the way, anyone who would like to help us in the Diocese of Baton Rouge, yes. you can go to the uh, www. D-I-O-B-R dot O-R-G website, yep. and it will connect you to how, if you'd like to make an, uh, an online contribution, we would mm -hmm. uh, very much welcome that, or how, how you might help in other ways. We're also asking for solidarity in prayer. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not just a material situation. Mm -hmm. It is a spiritual situation. And the support of people in prayer means the world to us. Well, Bishop Munch, know that people I know are going to be supportive of you and are certainly, I think, attentive to the needs. And these are, as the bishop said, they need volunteers. They're going to need rebuilding materials because when you go into a house and your, you know, your, your walls are collapsing, you've got to rebuild the walls. You, you need roofing material. All these materials are going to have to be brought in because I know they're disappearing from shelves. So consider that as you, as you watch this. Bishop Munch, in our final moments, your spiritual message here. What is the message here for your people and the nation at large? When God created each of us individually, by choice, he gave us the grace of being created in his image and likeness. And he calls forth from us to show our care for one another. He requires of us to serve him by serving neighbor. Mm. And it's not just a question of a feeling or an intent. It's a question of a follow-through. And I have heard over and over through the years with, for example, high school students start doing service projects in preparation for confirmation. In our area, we do confirmation at the 11th grade. Mm -hmm. And they have said how much they visited, for example, uh, an old folks' home, as they call it, mm -hmm and they thought it was going to be boring, and they found out it was so inspirational for them and life-giving. Mm -hmm. When we do something good for someone else, it makes us feel good about ourselves. That's the aftermath of it, but we do it because God is entrusting this to us and making it possible through his love and his grace and his opportunity for us to reach out to others. Very good. Bishop Robert Munch, thank you so much for being here and know that our prayers are with you and the people of Baton Rouge and Livingston, Lafayette, Lake Charles, uh, all of our friends and families there. And you can give to the Diocese of Baton Rouge and help in this moment of need. They have a, a Diocese of Baton Rouge Disaster Assistance Fund set up. Visit the diocesan website. It's D-I-O-B-R dot org. D-I-O-B-R dot org. The details are there. Look for the link in the middle of the homepage. And please keep the people of southern Louisiana in your prayers. Up next, Mother Teresa is set to be canonized in September. But there are those who say she is no saint, believe it or not. We'll run through their charges and expose the facts with Catholic League President Bill Donahue. The World Over Live returns in a moment. Stay right there. As for the woman uh, styling herself Mother Teresa, I can attest that until I wrote my little pamphlet, she had uh, been the recipient, the beneficiary of a 25-year Niagara 
of 100% favorable publicity in every secular, Protestant, Jewish, and Catholic or non-religious outlet of any kind at all in the media. Only by the grace of my intervention could it not be said, <laughs> could it not be said when she died that no one had ever said a single word against her. <laughs> both Christopher Hitchens and Mother Teresa had one thing in common. They both professed to have something in common with regard to the poor. They both said they were concerned about the poor. Unlike Mr. Hitchens, Mother Teresa actually did something about the poor. So she... <laughs> That was my next guest and the deceased journalist Christopher Hitchens debating Mother Teresa, which they did many times. As she is poised to be declared a saint by Pope Francis at the top of September, old criticisms of Mother Teresa are being revived. My next guest has launched a preemptive strike on any who would disparage her legacy or sanctity. He is Bill Donahue, president of the Catholic League and author of the new book, Unmasking Mother Teresa's Critics. Welcome to the program, Bill Donahue. Why write a book like this on the eve of Mother Teresa's canonization? I mean, talking about her critics, why not just celebrate her? Well, I think we should celebrate her, and that's just it, though. The guy who passed away, Christopher Hitchens, he was my sparring buddy. We had mm. many a fights. At least he was fun to fight with. Uh, he was wrong on just about everything, what he said about her. Mm. But, but after Christopher died in 2011, uh, other people who sort of emerged, maybe not of the same stature. And knowing what the media are like, they always like to be the contrarian. So if Mother Teresa is so great, and she was, in fact, voted the most admired person right. in the 20th century over Martin Luther King, Billy Graham, John Paul II, and other stellar people, uh, you just know there's going to be the contrarian element. Well, let's see, maybe she's not all that good. And then we can kind of revisit all the criticisms of her. They are so unfair, and that's why I wrote this book. There's a Dr. Arup Chatterjee that you introduced me to. I'd never right. heard of this guy, right. who's, uh, you mentioned at the top of the book, he is really the guy who got the ball started on this kind of anti-Mother Teresa narrative that persists even to this day. We'll get into some of the more recent critiques. Who is he? Who well, is he's, this Dr. He's, he's, a, he's an Indian physician. And he was upset with her because she gave Calcutta, his hometown, a bad name. Now, just think of the logic here. There's a lot of destitute people in Calcutta for all kinds of different reasons. She goes there. She leaves the sisters of Loretto to go there. She wants to tend to the poor, the dispossessed. And because she does that, and she becomes discovered because of Malcolm Mug Muggeridge, a BBC right. reporter, then Calcutta becomes associated with destitution. It's almost like as if she, they're blaming her yeah. for the reputation instead of heralding her for doing what she could to help these poor people. I mean, it, it, the, the logic is, is, is so irrational. But that's also true of the other critics as well. Right. Well, you talked about Christopher Hitchens, whom yes. I knew. He was here sure. in D.C. Uh, poor Christopher died of, of cancer. But he was so... It was a, almost a blind hatred of Mother Teresa. What was it? What, what unites all of these critics? And what do you think drove... Well, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. You know, I started this thing uh, really over the winter because I've been debating him for a long time. I've yeah. had rallies in the support of Mother Teresa and the like. So I had something invested in it. Uh, quite frankly, there, there are two salient characteristics that are, are true of all of her most severe critics. Number one, they are militant atheists, not just atheists, militant atheists. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they regard Catholicism as if it were some kind of a hate speech. Number two, they're all far on the left. I didn't say liberal. Far on the left, socialist, and I can explain to you if you want mm -hmm. as to why would a socialist be upset with her? Yeah, why? 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 Why, why would they take At issue first, with it this? wasn't She's exactly helping the poor. And well, see, that's just it. In the socialist mentality, that's the job of the state, and they make it very clear. She's interfering with. They accused her of interfering with the job of government to take care of the poor, as if the government's done a great job. They mm -hmm. typically create dependency. And by the way, she wasn't against the idea of the government stepping right. into helping the poor. What she wanted was that old Catholic way of doing things, one-on-one, -on -one, a face relationship mm -hmm. between the person who's the helper and the person whom you're helping. Yeah. But they resented the fact that she was also an altruist. As a matter of fact, they regard altruism as a myth. So here we have this nun who doesn't draw attention to herself. She's motivated by Catholicism. She's interfering with the statist idea of helping the poor, and she believes in God. I mean, this is just too much for the atheist and the socialist to bear. Uh -huh. And that's what that's the uniting cord 
for all of these uh, critics of her. I know. I knew Mother Teresa. I, I followed her around many, many times, did some pieces on her, interviewed her. Uh, she was an extraordinary woman. How anybody can say there was not sanctity in this woman. She was not beautiful to look at, but boy, was she radiant and beautiful to be with. Um, I want to get into some of the criticisms sure. because these have been around for a long time, Bill. Right. They didn't just crop up. One is Mother Teresa took all these huge donations, millions and millions of dollars from people like Charles Keating, uh, Baby Doc uh, Javalier, Devalier. Uh, I'm going to read something you have in your book. This comes from uh, Murray Kempton, who writes, The swindler Charles Keating gave her 1.2 million dollars, most dubiously his own to give, and she rewarded him with the personalized crucifix he doubtless found of sovereign use as an ornamental camouflage for his pirate flag. Is that what we have here? A woman who took money, she didn't, she had no regard for whom she took it from, and does that in any way degrade her? Look, her look, if, if you are poor and you're suffering, you're, you're suffering from malnutrition, and most of the world's leaders are despots. And if some of those despots are going to give you some money, and you take the money not to go on a fast weekend to Vegas, you're not going on the cruise, you know. You're taking the money to give to the poor so you can build the hospices, the, the, the leper settlements and the like. Mm -hmm. What in the world? Why wouldn't she do something of that nature? And by the way, Robert Maxwell, the publisher, he right. was a crook. Charles Keating, uh, the financier, right. he was a crook. She had the money spent before it was exposed that these guys were crooks. So what is she supposed to do? Go back and try and get the money from the mouths of the poor to give it back to them? See, they never tell you that. They leave it out. That's why I wrote this book too, Raymond, because they leave out these central facts. If you find out after the fact that the money is spent that the guy was a crook, what are you supposed to do with that? Yeah, it's, not, it's, not, it's not giving not like moral if, sanction to what they did. Absolutely not. It's not like as if, well, I know you're a crook and give me some money, Al Capone. You know what I mean? Right, <laughs> That's what right. they make it well, out Well, there's also a Catholic teaching of giving alms to expiate yes. your sins. Right. And maybe she saw, maybe she did know what she was dealing with up front with some of these people and saw that as a charitable act. She's helping the poor. She's not enriching herself. Now, this brings up another criticism. Mm -hmm. Some say, look, she, she collected millions upon millions of dollars and look at the conditions of these homes and these institutions and these hospices that she created. They say uh, they were cramped conditions, they, that the, the beds were too close together, they weren't given the, the top flight of care and medicines that some of these people might have gotten. Your answer would be what? Well, I think the most severe critics on this are Serge Larravee and two other Canadians. Mm. Uh, they, 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 there are three professors out of the University of Montreal in Ottawa who made that charge most specifically. And they're saying that uh, they quote a Dr. Robin Fox, who went over there and talked about the lousy hygiene. Well, I had to pay $3,000 to get the article translated. It's not translated from yeah. the French to the English to look yeah. at their work. Then I went to pay more money to get the work of Fox. All a lot of stuff is untranslated, but I got a hold of it because I'm determined to get to it. Guess what? Fox said just the opposite of what they said. In other words, the Canadians lied. I didn't say they made a mistake. Mm -hmm. When you lie, it means you know the truth. I know what this guy Fox said. He commended her for the hygiene that they had mm -hmm. there, just the opposite of what they said. And yes, no doubt, sometimes you're going to have tough quarters. If you have people dying of diseases because the hospitals won't accept them, Okay, they literally won't accept them. You have children who've survived abortions. You have the These malnourished. people in the streets. Yeah, I mean, people they, in they the were streets. Fall, their bodies are falling yeah, apart. Yeah, what do they think it is? The Waldorf Astoria? Of course it wasn't. I mean, she didn't make no pretense to be that. Then they weren't after because she lived an ascetic lifestyle as well. One critic said that she didn't go and in, wasn't involved in the intellectual and artistic life of Calcutta, <laughs> as if she should go to the opera as opposed to dealing with these. I mean, some of the critics are really, you know, yeah, yeah, they're, way, they're, way out there. Yeah, they're, they're stretching it. Way out there. Well, one of the things that I loved, I mean, if, if anyone who knows the missionaries of charity, whether they're in New York or San Francisco or Calcutta or wherever they are, they live with the people they serve. Mm -hmm. They're there. And they've got the same hygiene, the same living conditions. They wash their saris. They hang them up that night. They put them on again. It's a very austere life of prayer and service. And they don't confuse the two. It really is a, a You know, it's interesting, too. There was one atheist who worked with her, uh, Celeste Owen Jones. Mm -hmm. She's a former Catholic. And she's uh, uh, a, a pro-abortion. She's very clear about it. Mm -hmm. But she said, I looked at what she did. I went there and saw what was happening, unlike Christopher Hitchens, unlike the Canadians who never mm -hmm. interviewed anybody who worked there or worked or for her. her yeah. 
She saw what was happening. She said, my God, the woman really is a saint, even though I can't really believe in saints and miracles anymore. But if there ever was a saint, it's Mother Teresa. And she says, the only thing I can think of as to why she would give up her life for these people, because she's so determinedly pro-life. Mm. Because if you're pro-life with the unborn, it's an easy thing to say that you're going to be in favor of helping people. That's why I don't like this canard from some social justice people that if you are pro-life, you don't care about the poor. Nobody cares more about the poor than the pro-life people, let me tell you. Mm. I want to change gears for a moment. There's another issue that Chris Hitchens would mention all the time. He, he, and I heard it myself. He would say, Mother Teresa is a ghoul. She's obsessed with death. She's sadistic. She's got the home for the dying in Calcutta. And she, she loves to watch these people get very ill and die. You would say what? He went beyond that. So did the Canadians. They, so she would say, listen, I understand redemptive suffering. Mm. They don't understand Christ and they don't understand redemption. The idea of redemptive suffering, as James Hitchcock, the great Catholic historian, says, is probably the most radical idea in history. Right. The idea that I can unite my sufferings to Christ. Hmm. Now, one does not have to believe that. I believe it. You believe it. Catholics believe it. It's a radical conception. But why would you mock somebody? Why would you ridicule somebody who said, I can understand the sufferings of these poor, destitute, dispossessed people, and I'm uniting my sufferings to quit. At the same time, when she went through her dark moments, she felt the same way. Instead, that they do, they look down their nose, they're smug and are arrogant, these mm. critics of Mother Teresa. You go down the line, and you mentioned so many here in, the, in unmasking Mother Teresa's critics. Uh, there's a new story that has hit since this book went to press, and it's Hindu fundamentalists who are coming out now in the Indian parliament, and they're saying, Mother Teresa, she was really involved in a conversion scheme. The service <laughs> was an opportunity to bring people right, in, right. in weakened circumstances, and convert them to Christianity. Right, right. She gave them a pill to make them sicker so she could convert them. Well, I mean, this is absolutely astonishing. You know, I, 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 there's nothing I won't believe anymore from these people. They always are searching, and I keep, like, they're, they're running like a moving target, so you knock down this thing, the care was no good, she didn't believe in this. And, and they just keep making it up. I mean, Man. she was there to help people. She didn't ask. When she went to New York City to, to open up the first hospice for the AIDS patients, she didn't go around and ask them, by the way, are you Catholic, Protestant, Jewish? Do you believe in nothing? Mm -hmm. She was there to help them out. And then she was ridiculed for that as well, because they say she objected because she didn't want a public, uh, in a public building, she didn't want an elevator. They didn't point out that she said we would take the people, the handicapped, up the stairs ourselves, the sisters. Mm. But they don't, see, they left that out of it. They want to make it sound like as if she wanted to make them suffer. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you tell the truth about Mother Teresa, you will wind up as I did. I loved her before I wrote this book. I love her doubly now. Well, they, and they also have used even her postulator's book, which talks about, well, you see all those letters where she talks about the dark night of the soul that went on for 40 years, mm -hmm. a long time. And in that dark night, she doubted, she wrestled with, she didn't feel or was, wasn't able to sense Christ's presence, God's presence in her life. Her critics say, aha, we have proof. She didn't believe. She didn't even believe in the Eucharist you hold so dear. You would <laughs> my, say, well, my, my poor friend Christopher Hitchens, uh, uh, at least I'm not talking behind his back and he's passed away, yeah. but I told him many times to his face what a fraud he was, you know. Mm. Um, and, 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 and in this regard here, I mean, he knows better, or, or maybe he doesn't. I said, look, there's a profound difference between feeling Jesus and believing in Jesus. Mm. We don't always feel his presence. She never stopped believing. How do we know? But she was a daily communicant. Yeah. I mean, we know that. The reverence that she showed to Jesus is unquestioned. The fact that she had some dark moments of wondering whether she really felt Jesus' presence is an entirely mm -hmm. different conception. Mm -hmm. By the way, on Hitchens, i got to say this much, because yeah. he started this whole nonsense. He did. He wrote a 99-page book about it. As I told him right to his face several times on television and in formal debates, if you were a student of mine, I'd give you an F, and I'll tell you why. Because you didn't have one end note, one footnote, one no bibli bibliography, no attribution whatsoever. Now, if you want to take on the most serious person of the 20th century and say everybody else's idea of her is wrong, I'm okay with that. Prove that they're wrong. When you give me no proof, no evidence whatsoever, I have more footnotes in my book than I have pages, okay? And that's why I like working with Sophia Institute Press, Charlie McKinney, this guy doesn't get enough credit, Nora Malone, the editor. People she need to know more about Sophia Institute Press. They will do it the right way because they're interested in scholarship. 
Christopher was busy having a few extra, and he wouldn't. He wasn't bothered with with, with scholarship. So that's why I told him. I said, "You you're not you're entitled to your unsupported opinions, but don't expect me as a scholar to give it any credence." Do you think the canonization will wash away so many of these critics, or does it? Does it force them to double down? And they say, this is the Vatican trying to put a happy face on a woman who opposed female empowerment, was opposed to abortion, and, and, and was really very countercultural. I, I, I don't think it'll go away altogether, because I think that these people have a vested interest in trying to bring her down. And, you know, Christopher brought up that argument, too, as, as well as the Canadians. She should have been pro-abortion, even though Christopher himself personally was pro-life. Pro There's a contradiction yeah. there. But uh, she needed to empower women. That's how you get rid of poverty. Well, let's see now. If abortion is the way to empower women, then China should have a lot of free women. Why do they have the highest female suicide rate in the world? Mm. Because up until recently, they were told to abort their children. That's why. And according to that logic, if you have more abortion, you have less mouths to feed, why not practice infanticide? Why not kill all the kids who are one, two, and three years of age? You have all that many less mouths to feed, and then we can declare, see that with the champions of the poor. These people are malicious, and they're illogical. Why do you think they were so determined to bring her down? Is it because she was such an icon and loomed so large in the minds of the secular world as well as the Catholic world? I think whenever you touch on the subject of altruism, the seculars get nervous because it's typically associated with a person who's religiously motivated. Mm. Now, here you get this woman who never sought the limelight. It came to her. Mm. And they're trying to say, listen, you know, part of it is, is, is just this human uh, idea that if you make it too big, it'll take you down. Michael Phelps just had a tremendous run at the Olympics. I'm reading all these articles why he's not the greatest swimmer of all time. He's not the greatest <laughs> athlete of all time. I mean, look, why is America hated? Because we're number one. So I guess you have to go through that. The Catholic Church is hated because as far as I'm concerned, I don't care what people say. We are, in fact, the Cadillac of all religions, all right? I mean, <laughs> some people don't want to say that. I just did. So if you want to go after the Cadillac, you're going to go after the Catholic Church. She's at the, she's at the epicenter. She drives the Cadillac, okay, Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a lot of things for your buck there. You, know, you, you can really smack at her, go against altruism, go against the Catholic Church, go against the idea of helping the poor. Sure. I want to talk about Macy's. You have oh. been locked in a battle with Macy's for the last few months. Uh, this is about a detective, Javier Chavez. Yes. Who is called to a woman's bathroom. Tell us what happened and why you're so exercised about this. You're, you're issuing a press release yeah. a week. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to give up on this. And people need to understand what's at stake here. You had a situation. Let me tell you about a, an African-American woman here about five years ago. She was working for Macy's, and they had these men. They're cross-dressers. They, they, they call them transgender people. They're cross-dressing men. And they go into the woman's bathroom, and she objected. And uh, Macy said, well, if you're not going to enforce the policy, we're going to fire you. And they did. Mm -hmm. Now, what makes this case even more interesting to me, Javier Chavez, this guy is in Flushing, New York, here a couple of months ago in May. And uh, a woman and her daughter see a, a man and a woman in the woman's room. They come out, and they make, make a complaint. This security guard then has one of his deputies go and investigate. In fact, the man was in there, and they said, get out. If you want to use the men's room, use the men's room. Next thing you know, he lodges a complaint, all right? And then they bring in Chavez. They say, didn't you know that Macy's has a policy that men can use the women's room if they declare themselves to be a woman? He said, I didn't know this. Hmm. Then they brought him back a second time. He said, no, I, I got it. I understand that. And he says, as a Catholic... I can't go along with it, but, and this is the important thing that the viewers should understand, he said, if that's your policy, I will enforce it. There was no insubordination like arguably there was with, with the African-American woman. Mm -hmm. He's called in a day or two later and he's fired. He's fired for his beliefs, not because he refused to do his job. He's, this, these, this is the Macy's thought police. The, the man was fired for entertaining a thought, a belief, that Macy's objected to, the thought was a man should use the men's room. This is, I mean, we know the society is spinning out of control in many respects, but this mega giant, Macy's, the boldness of these people, that, that this, now this is going to be, it, it's being before the, uh, uh, the, the courts and the, the, an administrative uh, situation uh, in New York City. They're going to go through the human rights thing. Raymond Nardo mm -hmm. is a great uh, uh, Long Island uh, uh, attorney who's representing Mr. Chavez. Mm -hmm. But the people need to know about this. And if you go to our website, you'll see the information where you can contact Macy's about now, this. Now, some would say, Bill, 
Right. If a man wants to work at Macy's, whether he's a Catholic or not, if he can't abide by their policies, and if his religious beliefs are so uh, prohibitive to those policies, then he can't do that job. Well, you would say that, what? I would say this. Listen, at the Catholic League, we have people who work in the policy section. They're all committed Catholics. I have had in the past mm -hmm. people dealing with the accounting section and the processing section who are not Catholic. As long as they were not oppositional to the church teachers, what would I care? Now, what if I met a guy who was working as in the accounting area in the processing uh, of, the, of the membership? Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you know, I got a sister. She's a lesbian and whatnot. And I, I personally, I guess I've come around. I'm not... I'm not wild about it, but I'm okay with two men getting married. I'm not going to fire him because I have more tolerance and respect for the fact that this guy can still do his job. He's not interfering with the Catholic League's end, the front end of getting the stuff mm -hmm. out there. So what? See now, if Macy's, if this guy said to Macy's, "I'm not going to do the job, and I have my religious convictions," that would be an interesting case. But he case. didn't say that. He didn't say that. He said, "I will enforce the policy," but. I'm entitled to my point of view, and they say, no, you, you're not allowed to think the way you want to think if it's against the way we think. That's thought control. That's totalitarian. Got to get to this before I let you go. Earlier this week in Oklahoma City at the Civic Center, mm -hmm. a publicly owned facility, right. a guy who's done this before conducted a black mass, a satanic mass, in his words. Uh, I won't get all, into all the details. They're pretty graphic and nasty. Uh, the bishop there decided, Archbishop Coakley, we're just having a prayer rally. We're going to have a march. That's it. You were kind of restrained on this issue. Why? Well, because I think Archbishop Coakley did a fine job in 2014 yeah, with the well. same man as a registered sex yeah. offender. Mm -hmm. um, the there's something wrong going on here. And uh, I'm going to follow the lead. Uh, I'm not here to jump in front of the bishops. I'm here to support the bishops. And, if that, and I think Coakley is a responsible archbishop. And... Uh, this guy was looking for a grandstand. You see, we, we can't yeah, always What is give... he trying to do here? He... I mean, explain to people what well, he's, he's trying to he's do. Trying to my get... estimation, he's, he's... this isn't... He's not trying to revive the satanic faith. No. He's trying to test the limits of for the First Amendment right, free speech, well, that's... and religious and, tolerance, and, 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 right? And he's intentionally trying to insult us, which is why he chose on Monday the 15th, the Feast of the Assumption, mm -hmm. to do this little act here. Look, the First Amendment by the founders, when they understood this... Free speech was a means toward an end, the good society. It wasn't an end in and of itself. What is the purpose of what he's doing here? There's no, there's no end to the good society and something of this nature. And if, if you, on public grounds, if I can't put a nativity scene because people say, oh, I object to that, those taxpayers, many of them are Catholic. Why should they be forced to pay for, for, for a, a, an event of hate speech which has nothing to do with political discourse in, in the civic arena. No, the, 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 it's not just the authorities there in Oklahoma City who dropped the ball. This whole country doesn't think correctly about freedom in the First Amendment in many, many different ways. Bill Donahue, the book is Unmasking Mother Teresa's Critics. We thank you for being thank here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Unmasking Mother Teresa's Critics by Bill Donahue is available at bookstores everywhere and online. It's also available as an e-book. And before we go, last week I told you about the remake of the Oscar-winning first-century epic Ben-Hur and chatted with producers Mark Burnett and Roma Downey. It opens August 19th in the U.S. That chariot ride is worth the price of admission. And as summer winds down, I'm hearing such great things from readers of Will Wilder, The Relic of Perilous Falls. While I was traveling last week, one reader sent me his book report, including pictures. This made my week. I love that the young and young at heart are taking the trip to Perilous Falls and finding much more than adventure there. It's also a great way to prepare for the second book of the Will Wilder series, which premieres next March. Well, that is all the time we have. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. You can also sign up for my free e-blast there. Don't miss our next show. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thanks for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.